book running risk to launching a platform. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those nuances and I think why CMC is better for having a trader build a trading platform and manage risk. And at the same time, some of the features that we've added into CMC Invest as a result of that trading platform. Disclaimers. So we talked a little bit about this, but this is more the invest journey than the pure CFD journey. And this is testament to Lord Brothers' incredible journey of, of 34, 35 years in the market. CMC is not a new player to this industry. We are CMC Invest Singapore is new to Singapore, but we have a 35 year heritage in building trading platforms globally. 12 offices, multiple licenses in, in some of the hardest jurisdictions in the world like Germany, Singapore, Australia, the UK. In that sense, we have a huge amount of trust with regulators. And not only that, we have 1.4 million customers. So our customers, they trust us even more with their most prized assets, which is securities and cash. Most importantly, in the last two years, we've launched UK Invest and Singapore Invest. This is a huge milestone for the group and our diversification aspirations. Trust is a really important word for us. It's not just a word, but it's, it's what you give us every day and what we hope to, as custodians of your assets, is what we try and uh, uh, build, uh, build towards. So specifically in Australia, we have seven major banking partners. Uh, all of you have heard of ANZ, but some of the smaller, smaller banks in Australia, they trust us. We have you know, 1.2 million customers there, and we're, we're gonna be doing the same thing in Singapore. We have fantastic content. I think content's often overlooked, but trading insights, trade ideas, up-to-date information is one of the most important things in what is a bit of a misinformation universe we live in. Having information at your fingertips is incredibly important, and Opto is a game changer for CMC in that regard. And by the way, Opto, especially for retail base clients, is not only ideas, but it's, in, it's all thematic and nearly all ETF related. So it really is targeted at our retail audience. One of the reasons CMC Invest is here is a few years ago, the board led by Peter, Matt, who's in the audience today, they embarked upon a huge diversification project. We were number one and number two globally in CFDs, but that wasn't enough. And like all great businesses, we decided to look at diversification. We already had the Australian brand, and we decided that Invest would be rolled out globally. But in addition to that, because Peter's ambitious, he thought, what else can I do? So at the same time, we're building a OTC options platform, which is built, we've all tested it, it's superb. Matt in the Australian office is rolling out our crypto platform as we speak, like it's, it's live with our staff now. <coughs> Wealth, I'll be able to share a little bit more about in the coming weeks. Um, well, and we already have CFDs. The important thing here is if you look at some of the best companies in the world, and we, we, we refer to them as FANG, as, as sort of universally, they all started off as a single platform like CMC, just doing CFDs and FX. But if you look at their, their, their growth and evolution, they've all gone into streaming, cloud, devices, health, and they're now a one-stop shop. Well, that's what CMC's aspiration is. We will become a one-stop shop, a super app for our customer base. Now, we have our target audience. I think, if, I think it's fair to say that the, the likes of Poems are targeting a slightly higher, affluent, older Singaporean generation. The likes of Moo Moo and Tiger are, are targeting a younger trading generation. CMC has a target audience, but one of our most important target audiences that is, in, in our opinion, underserved is the female investing audience. It's, it's, 50% of this population and 50% roughly of Southeast Asia. And from what we're seeing, it's incredibly underserved with most brokers having under 4% of their customers being females. And in our view, 
and through market research, we feel this is a huge opportunity. Not only are we targeting our affluent, high net worth individuals, but more importantly, we would like to introduce women back into the financial services industry. And so after our short discussion with Peter, um, we will have a panel of five incredible um, athletes, uh, investors, TV hosts, and, and, and we want to promote that. Lastly, this is the roadmap. So what you see Invest and CMC now is going to morph. Within 18 months, it is a completely different business. Diversification of revenue streams, diversification in terms of who we serve, our customer base, countries, but more importantly, product and features. We've not touched upon some of the core features that we're building now around on-ramp through crypto. Apple Pay, for example. These are all in the plan and being built now. So, happy to take any questions now, or we can leave that to uh, an audience with Peter, as, as you see fit. And if anyone has any questions, I'm um, happy to answer, and if not, we'll go straight into the dialogue with, uh, with Lord Crudders. Right, Pam, shall we go straight in then? Thank you. Peter, would you like to come up? Yeah. Chris, are you going to join us in this conversation? <laughs> it's work, it's working. Here we go. Here we All go. All right. Yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining. I think, um, you know, uh, Chris has just given a very nice overview of the history. Um, I, as I was walking in, I also got a little tour of what was told to me as the past, present, and the future. Uh, it was a very interesting little experience. Um, so congratulations on the launch here in Singapore. Um, jumping right into the conversation, um, basically we would like to get a sense of the change in the investment landscape and how uh, CMC is um, working to address that market um, as well as provide the services uh, for, for the audience. So as a start, there has been a lot of consolidation happening in the marketplace um, with social media players, with various different businesses entering this space to democratize, um, to provide access. What, um, what would you say is the driving force and the need for this consolidation market? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very formal here, isn't it? I mean, first of all, I'd like to say how nice it is to be back in Singapore. I've been coming here more or less for sort of 15, 20 years. Uh, love Singapore. It's an awesome place to do business. I don't know if any of you have been to Europe recently, but we are regulating ourselves into oblivion. It's so nice when you come to an environment here that encourages entrepreneurs. Uh, Europe used to be like that, uh, but now there's so much red tape and regulation, not quite sure why. I mean, I even had to take a modern slavery exam. Uh, it's just a test, you know, it took me 20 minutes, 10 minutes, but I mean, it's a waste of my time. But people feel that I need to know about modern slavery. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, so, Singapore is a great place to do business, always has been, it's getting better. I like the regulator here, the regulator is very strong. As a, a, a strong company ourselves, we like strong regulations because it keeps the bad guys away, they're very flexible and very proud that we got a capital markets license in this country. That is an achievement in itself because you have to show financial strength, uh, a track record of strong regulations, and that's an endorsement of our company and where we are today. And it was a proud moment when we got our capital, full capital markets license in Singapore. 
I'd also like to thank Chris, uh, Chris Forbes and Matt Lewis. Matt's on the main board of the company. He heads up, uh, he's head of uh, Asia Pacific. He uh, works out of Sydney. Uh, and Chris Forbes came in to set all of this up. And they've worked really well together. They leveraged off technology that we had in Australia. So thank you guys for getting this whole show on the road. It was a massive achievement for us. And from my point of view as well, it shows the diversity and the scale in CMC markets um, because we were able to leverage off of technology outside of our core CFD business, our invest technology that we've been running in uh, Australia. We want our clients to make money, okay? We're not working against our clients to make money. Why do we want our clients to make money? Because they keep trading. It's so much better to have a client that stays with you for a long time, keeps investing, keeps giving us our commissions, keeps diversifying their portfolio. So what we're trying to do with our invest platform is to give our clients something that um, we think the market is lacking which is knowledge, which is transparency, which is oversight of what's going on in the financial markets, and also fast, quick, accurate execution. You can trade with us 24 hours a day. We're not a local broker. You've got very good local brokers here. But we see ourselves as a local broker and an international broker. So if you, know, if you need to respond to some sort of event around the world, you know that with our multi-asset platform, either using investment products, CFDs, foreign exchange, you should get access to that. And CMC has been a pioneer of trading. I remember, saw my old desk out there in reception area. I uh, started with a very small room, no windows, just myself. And... Um, I remember back then, we transformed the financial markets. CFDs are not a product, they're a settlement term. If you trade Facebook, either as a physical share, an ETF, a CFD, or some sort of portfolio, all your, you trade the core price of Facebook, and then you settle the trade, and you either settle it through physical or CFDs, etc. We pioneered and drove down the costs of trading for the retail market because we were the first to the market with an internet platform. And what that meant is, uh, I mean, effectively, and I'm not saying this is a good thing, but a client can open an account, fund the account, trade, invest, and make money, withdraw that money, and he can do that all in a few minutes or hours, and we never even speak to that person because we can do the whole process electronically. It's a bit like if you're booking a ticket, you want to come to London to enjoy the weather, and uh, I'm joking about the weather, by the way. Um, you don't really want to talk to anybody. You just want to go on to the, uh, the web page, book a ticket, get your seat, select the ticket, book the hotel, get everything done. And that's what we're trying to do for uh, the investment community here. Anyway, I don't know if I answered your uh, question, <laughs> yeah. Pamela, but... Well, um, well before, before we get to um, the following questions, Chris, do you want to chime in on the establishment uh, leading up to this point of the launch? Because I know you have been working on the business for quite some time. So a lot of it was new to me. Uh, I, I probably wrongly assumed, so I know markets and trading and, 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 and consumer behavior well, but I, learning the tech side was a real, uh, an eye-opening experience. And that was probably the hardest thing to get my head around. The governance, the board, uh, licensing was not an issue. I actually found the MAS to be incredibly helpful, to be, to be honest. I think they have a reputation for being staunch, but, and, and they are, but, but, but also very commercial. And so none of that phased me. 
Um, we were lucky because we had, as Peter said, we had a great tech stack already. So to leverage off that was very useful. And one of the examples of that is if you look at some of the brokers in Singapore, they offer three, sometimes five markets. Well, we launched with 15 straight away. And so that is a real game changer in terms of you know, just giving customers um, immediate access. So, but I mean, otherwise, it was just lots of, I, I hate Teams, Microsoft Teams, if any of you use that. I, I can't stand Every that. Every single thing. day. Yeah. <laughs> it's too much Teams. Um, and I like pace. Being a trader, you like, you like pace. And, and, and I think that that was something I've had to really learn through this 15 months. It was that not everyone can run at the pace I want. So that was the hardest thing for me. Well, Peter, you had mentioned the electronic trading, obviously having that access at your fingertips, being able to make those trades very easily accessible to people, and also diversifying the pool so that markets are more efficient. Um, so when it comes to, to your platform and what you're seeing in terms of the trends for the marketplace, what are some, some of the newer trends and how is CMC uh, addressing those? Well, um, first of all, trends, obviously, they change quite frequently. I mean, cryptos were three years ago. Everybody needed to get into cryptos. And we saw our volumes in cryptos go like this. And then I think there are ridiculous, maybe 50,000 uh, cryptocurrencies, non-fungible tokens. The point, it doesn't matter really what the trend is. I mean, clients at the moment are trading oil, they're trading gold, uh, they're trading... That. Clients like to trade the index a lot, indices around the world, because um, then they can take a sort of holistic view of the financial markets. The point for us is that we have to be able to respond to trends. So if there's an IPO, Birkenstock, I think, listed yesterday, we need to get the grey market on the platform. We then, when the first strike happens, we need to be able to offer that to our clients. And that's what we do really well, pricing, execution, uh, product delivery. And so trends come and go. We have to respond to that. And that's the strength of CMC markets. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Chris. Um, I mean, apart from Chris's brilliance. And, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, it's probably an old trend, like Peter said, but I think wealth or, and wealth tech in Singapore has been a big thing. It, it, to me, especially the Singapore market, it wants to put their money in a single portfolio and just sleep easy at night. And so if you look at the Singapore market, it's traditionally been a very much of a yield play. So, and hence, if you look at the exchange, you've got banks, brokers, and real estate, and REITs, and they're all just between 3 and 6%, 3 and 7% yield. And that traditionally has been a good play. But the emerging trend um, is really having sort of, let's call it money market funds or some sort of fund where you can put all of your money and just sleep easy. And so really that's the next cab off the rank at, at, at for CMC, building that really simple portfolio where we will do all of the work in the back end and allow you to sleep easy at night. So that's the the sort of emerging trend that we're looking at. In addition to that, um, it's things like having a great charting package. Everyone in the world uses um, TradingView. Having access to information, well, and that's why we built Opto. So those types of trends, we're certainly on. The, the most obvious trend is being able to fund your portfolio through crypto and or an immediate on-ramp through Apple Pay. Again, things like that, um, they're in the works for us as well. So what about the fact that, because it's ever-evolving, uh, as, as you both mentioned, the educational aspect, um, and being bringing along your clients on this journey and then being able to provide them also with information and being able to, to leverage perhaps the resources you have to help your clients. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so... Again, I'll go back to Opto because unfortunately, I know it's... It's the easiest way to, to describe this, but Opto is it's a free platform for all of our customers. It's on our website, it's on our trading platform, it's completely free. They have some of the most amazing speakers on there every month, podcasts, videos, articles. 
and, and there's a small, there's a small um, example of it on the wall here, but they really break down your investments into themes. And they say, well, how do I, if, if you like Tesla, one of the best things about, if you like Tesla, then you should, as an investor, understand, well, what are the components? Who makes the solder? Who makes the glass? Who makes the tires? Because Tesla doesn't do those things. If Tesla does well, there's a rising tide story for all of those component makers. And that's where something like an ETF or custom basket approach is incredibly powerful. And you can only get that through reading something like, and not exclusively, something like an opto, who will break that down for you. So that type of thing. And then the other thing, obviously, is like everyone just buys an S&P tracker now and just leaves it in their portfolio. And it represents 50% of their portfolio. And they pick stocks around it. And that's exactly what Opto will help you do, effectively do asset allocation for your portfolio within your CMC account. As long as you don't pick ARC, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right, okay. Well, now, um, you mentioned earlier the younger demographic and also the female demographic. Um, my understanding is that the pandemic not only helped drive their interest and participation in online trading, but also accelerated that trend. So I believe it was the CFA Institute that had said something like 80% of female um, investors who are investing are using online trading platforms. And the age of female investors have lowered and they have said that they will or are wanting to participate in the near future within a year. So these kind of stats and data uh, points, wh wh what do they tell you? Well, first of all, I live in a, well, my family, I've got uh, three daughters, um, a wife, and, and I used to have two female cats as well. So where, wherever I move, uh, there's female. My youngest daughter's a vascular surgeon. The other day she cut somebody's leg off and, um, you know, uh, it was an operation, it was, um, but um, it just shows you the capability and, you know, uh, the strength of women in society and how much they contribute. And I think Chris has highlighted that on occasions, we don't really cater for that and we should. And um, so we're very supportive of anybody really that wants to come into the trading community, we want to help them, we want to support them, and it doesn't matter to us, really, um, what, what, where they're from, what their background is. So it's, it's quite a unique push for us to help sort of, we, we need to establish ourselves as a business in the investing community here. Investing communities, and I know there's been some changes here recently, but if you look at the financial markets around the world, um, there's a lot of companies. It's a crowded space in, in most countries. So you have to compete hard. And I think it's got beyond now. Um, you can't really compete on price anymore. You have to compete on service. You have to compete on content. And the more you can push back to help clients make money, and Making money isn't actually always picking the right, right stock at the right time. We all think that's the generic way to make money. But there's a lot of preamble around that. So, for example, you, you're not going to pick the right stock at the right time 24-7. If you make a mistake or if you're in an investment, it's about transparency and being able access to reducing your position or hedging your position. And I think that's the strength of CMC. So you have to have a complete package. If you see firms here saying, well, commission free this, commission free that. How can they service you? It's all about service ultimately, because financial markets, especially in Singapore, are very mature now, very well-educated population access to great internet um, um, capability. So it's about going to the next level. It's no good just offering people cheap trading. People expect that, that's your starting point. And what it, it does as well, makes it a very high barrier to entry. I mean, if I was to sit down and write a business plan, 
starting from scratch today and say, forget, forget Singapore, but say UK CFD market, it, you, I don't think you could get funding for it because the profit margins are so small that what you need is scale. You have to have clients and you have to have good turnover. And we're leveraging off of that from our investment business globally, primarily from Australia, where they've got an incredible brand, incredible platform, and 1.4 million clients. We did the biggest uh, transfer of client assets and clients from ANZ Bank to us and over two weekends, and it was the biggest transfer in history of clients. So it's about leveraging off of that scale, meaning that we can come to Singapore and we don't have to cut corners on service. We have the scale already, and so now, you know, that's the next big level for us. Um. <laughs> I think um, I used to do a lot of... Um, I was forced by my previous company to, because I was a bit arrogant to do a lot of charitable work. And my boss would send me to India and Cambodia. Um, I went to Laos and I sat on a board in Myanmar. And, it, and we were effectively giving microfinance loans. And during that process, what it taught me is that all of the borrowers of those loans, and I'd say all about 90% were women. And they would do community-based lending and we would buy them seeds fertilizer, whatever it was, to, to grow crops, and they would sell them and repay the loans. But the default, let's call them the NPLs, from a finance perspective, were almost negligible, like 0.1, 0.2%. It showed me then that women were the ones that held all of the money, so the men would work, but then at the end of each week, the women would take their money because they knew the men would go and do lots of drinking and gambling in those countries. And so the women did, had all of the finances and they took all of the investment risk and actually they didn't invest afterwards. So through that experience, it taught me that there is a huge, in Singapore, but also in Southeast Asia, opportunity with women. And what it means is that women are brave, they're shrewd and they're underserved. And that's one of the main reasons we chose, if you look at the color scheme, if you look at our platform, it is not a black and white, it's not a black platform. There is research out there now, which we've done, that if you have a black platform, it's intimidating to women. So our platform is white. If you look at the color schemes, the fonts, everything's been intentionally designed around making it more inclusive for us and for women. And so to answer the question about female investing, we did a lot of research um, about why it's important to build our platform the way we've built it. Uh, your, your business, based off of trading based off of scale. Uh, obviously, the health of the market um, is, is a big factor. You mentioned crypto earlier, which at this point is, you know, <laughs> a, a couple of years ago, and we're past that now. But what about the fact that equity markets right now, there's so much volatility, and then if we pull back a little bit more, looking at the conversation around the macro situation, around policy rates, the uncertainties, the geopolitics, all of these factors, which we also are seeing how it's impacting the IPO market, um, how do all those factors play into uh, how your business is running and whether or not you need to address that? We love volatility. <laughs> I mean, you know, as long as I've been in the financial markets, just trying to work out since 1971, I think, um, Volatility has always been there. There's always, there are always events. I mean, there are too many to mention. But um, so that, that is good for us in theory, uh, in reality as well. Just seeing changes in the market, uh, different things happening, different opportunities, new companies emerging. I mean, 20 years ago, Facebook didn't exist. 20 years ago, Google didn't exist. Apple was nowhere. These are now the biggest companies in the world. Not Facebook, but uh, they're pretty big. Um, and um, so it's all about, you know, staying dynamic and following the market trends, keeping, 
you know, everybody should sort of go on to Opto every day and just sort of read about what's going on. And we, we don't talk enough about Opto. In fact, Opto, this is the first place that we've launched it. Um, don't think we're quite there yet in Australia, and we are, yeah? But on the white label stuff, we're doing it? Yeah. Yeah. But Opto is kind of a really fantastic app for us. And, you know, you should just go on to that and um, just really keep up to date with the markets. The end game for us is to have a multi-asset platform, which we're almost there on, but also the generic financial portal in every major financial center, including Singapore. What do I mean by that? Well, in the mornings, what you do is you go onto your financial portal, the CMC portal, and effectively, you can do everything from there, um, you know, invest in, but also things like uh, pay your bills or, you know, reconcile your bank accounts or get your car insurance. Eventually, I mean, we're, you know, three to five years away from that. Let's get, let's get this show on the road first. But ultimately, we want investors in Singapore and traders in Singapore, they're the same really, um, to just come onto our platform, get all the content they need, and never go anywhere else. That would be pretty, pretty cool. So yeah. your aspirations are a super app. Yeah, I mean that—that's the direction of travel. Yeah, for sure. It's the on, i think it's the—it's the only outcome for CMC. And you're kind of seeing now most apps going that direction. But we're also seeing a lot of consolidation in the market, right? And I think TD Ameritrade is the first of, of, of many brokers that will be exiting, mainly because or either regulatory or they can't get the scale that Peter is referring to. Can I just add one other very important point? You're seeing a lot of portals, no names mentioned, but there's a few in Europe, whereby they're trying, their, their aspiration is to to get this generic financial portal whereby they can offer you everything. The problem with that is that unless you own the pricing, the execution, and the scale, then all you are is just an aggregator or a portal for other people's services. What we're able to do is to price financial products ourselves or direct you straight to different exchanges. That gives us a competitive advantage over people that have the same ambition as us. Because um, I remembered back in uh, 1994 when I read about something called the internet. And I thought, well, this will be really good. I think I'll buy this company. And uh, pretty, learn pretty quickly that the, the power of the internet, and obviously you couldn't buy it. But um, the thing that struck me, and it's in my book, we should have uh, copies of my book somewhere, Passport to Success, and explains how I viewed the internet. And, and very basically, I thought the power of the internet will allow Singapore Airlines to sell directly to its clients because they own the aircraft and they own the seats they could cut out the middle broker. And if you have a generic financial product, but it's other people's pricing, other people's execution, you have to get paid and they have to get paid. And so then you've got cost layering coming in. And it means a company like CMC, we can, we can be more competitive, we can drive down costs because we've got scale, we own the pricing, we own the execution, we own the aggregation. So we think we're in a pretty good position and we've got 30 odd years of experience of doing it. In fact, longer could before I started CMC. I think it's quite an important point anyway. Absolutely. And what about the fact that now AI, robo investing, big data analytics, how do all those things factor in? I have no idea, <laughs> and I don't need to have. I mean, there's enough smart people in the company that are on top of that, but um, 
I mean, I remembered, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was in Australia, and we were talking about blockchain. Is anybody really talking about blockchain anymore? Um, doesn't seem to be... It seemed to, back then, two years ago, three years ago, it was going to be the next big thing. What are you doing about blockchain? And I said, there's nothing you can really do about blockchain until all the exchanges and uh, all the prime brokers and so on, they all get blockchain, because then we can settle stuff real time. But until that happens, you can't really you know, capitalize on blockchain. And AI as well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff coming out around that. We'll be on top of it. But you just have to let these things evolve. I wonder whether we'll be talking about AI in three years' time when we're back and, um, to, you know, I'll be back before then. But um, it's interesting times anyway. Don't it? Um, so we've, we have started experimenting with AI internally. Um, using more BARD than we are ChatGPT and, and, and Jasper. But um, for now, it's more of an asset allocation tool, but it is largely retrospective as opposed to forward looking. It uses back data to predict future trends in our asset allocation tool. So we're not, it's not being utilized fully yet, but obviously there's things like chat functionality, which ourselves, Tiger, Moomoo have all started implementing, and that is um, AI based uh, and, and ChatGPT. The only thing I would add to Peter is I was, re I was uh, watching Chamath, um, who's a big um, investor uh, and the original Facebook founder, and he, he believes, and, and I think this is true, that AI is a little bit like the refrigerator. And the refrigerator was invented, but it's really cheap. There's no money to be made from selling fridges. But the money to be made is, is what you put inside the fridge. It's Coca-Cola your butter, your cheeses, because that stuff is huge margins and everyone in the world uses their fridge every day. But you can't make any money from fridges. And, and that's a little bit like AI. AI in itself is a wonderful thing, but no one's figured out how to really monetize it yet. What is the stuff that goes inside or around the AI? And that is a bit of an unknown. And, and I agree with Peter, we're still at its infancy to be able to really utilize it other than to help, you know, it's, it's a great marketing gimmick for now, but it's not fully utilizable. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, we are here in Singapore, we are in Asia Pacific. Um, given the current uh, environment, um, investments, I, I come from a commercial real estate um, firm at the moment, so the environment that everyone is very concerned about is um, in the U.S., there is a lot of credit risks, there is banking uh, crisis concerns, and as a result, there might be a lot more investors um, looking at Asia at the moment. When it comes to your platform, when it comes to growing um, your footprint in Asia, how do you view Asia, and maybe specifically Singapore, uh, in that global context? I mean... I think it's, in my view, I've been in Singapore for about 11 years now, and I've watched, if you hear this the right way, I've, I've seen the Lee Kuan Yew era, I've seen the post-Lee Kuan Yew era, and then I've seen a post-COVID era. And I think there are three very dis different government styles and, and different, um, different interest rate environment between all three of them. And the interest rate environment worries me tremendously because you can get paid 5 6% on your cash, risk-free. To put that in the stock market, most in retail investors will get six to seven percent, and you take a lot of risk. So there's no equity risk premium in the stock market right now, and that, that is of, of concern to me. The other, to come back to the other point, is I think Singapore is the hub. Sorry to say this about Australia, but I think it is the hub for Asia. I think it used to be Hong Kong, and I now think Singapore is the hub for Asia, not just Southeast Asia, but Asia. And that's a huge step for Singapore. Um, I think Japan's too domestic and Australia's largely domestic. And, and I think therefore Singapore, through the government and through the regulators, has done a great job of making this a huge hub. And you can see some of the big banks have moved a load of their staff from Hong Kong to Singapore and, and started making this their hub, family offices as well. So. I think the future for Singapore is incredibly bright. I mean, within the group, the Singapore office is really flourishing right now. 
and that's largely down to Kurt and, and, and Matt. And, and I think that's a, that it kind of testament to where I think Singapore is and what the potential is here. So I'm not worried about Singapore. I do have concerns about real estate in the US. <laughs> <laughs> Very different picture here. <laughs> uh, one thing I would say about Singapore, and I, obviously everything Chris says, watch the Middle East. Singapore cannot go to sleep, okay? Because the Middle East is beginning to really change. There's a lot of drive, a lot of focus in the Middle East to attract financial companies. It's very straightforward to do business there. There's a good infrastructure there. And I think for the first time in our lifetimes, we're seeing the Middle East emerge, forget conflicts and so on and different dynamics there. But um, that's a challenge for Singapore. So you, you can enjoy your status today. It's growing. It's a great place to do business in Singapore. We, you've got a very supportive regulator, but just keep one eye on the Middle East because we're seeing a lot of good stuff coming out of the Middle East. Uh, one thing that we haven't touched on, um, and, and also feel free to help me steer the conversation, <laughs> um, maybe is on the currency front, because there is a, such a strong connectivity um, in terms of FX, um, the weakness in the currencies in across Asia with policy divergent. Um, is that something that goes along with volatility that is opportunity? Yeah. That, like, so. FX is one of the strongest asset classes that CMC handles. Uh, on the CFD side, certainly, we're very strong in FX. On the, on the invest side, it's, it's, it's less important because of the, the business model is completely different. Um, is it an opportunity? For sure. But I, I think with the conflict in, 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 uh, in the Middle East at the moment, broadly speaking, oil and dollars are pretty well correlated. And, I, and I, I'm pretty long oil right now. Well, I would be, and therefore I know what I'm doing with dollars, and therefore I can guess what I'm doing with the rest of my currency base. So uh, it, it doesn't have a huge impact. I think the only, the, the biggest thing it has an impact on is, is deflation and inflation of, of, of how you import. And to be honest, there's a bit of a trade war going on anyway, globally, um, for mainly between two or three countries. So, but again, Singapore, we're largely isolated from it, and certainly from a platform perspective. It, 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 it just helps us because, as Peter says, volatility is generally speaking, and certainly in CMC's, CMC's case, it's, it should be your friend if you know how to use it and if you do, do your own research. Volatility is not a bad thing. In terms of some of the talking points I prepared um, and, and we prepared, I think we covered most of it. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? We can always talk about inflation. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I, I think the I think the media is probably bored of us two now. Okay. <laughs> and I think they're here to see Shante and and some of the fee we are panelists. So, uh, Mel, are you are you okay if we move on to? Oh, we have a break. Oh, any Q and A? That's the point. Like, can we do Q and A before we get a drink? Did, I know Lord Crudders is here. I know you all ask waiting to ask a question. Any hands? Yes, we do have one. Hi. Can you hear me? Sorry, I have one. Um, I missed the beginning of the panel, so apologies So, if you did cover this. But um, what I'm interested in, um, I work in financial literacy space with, with CMC Market Singapore, actually. Um, but one thing I'm interested in is where you, where you see the future with regards to young people and their investing interests. Because my experience is they're quite in, interested in very different things. And you talked a little bit about blockchain, and they, they're still talking about that, actually, a lot of young. And I'm interested in what you think um, they're interested in, because I see a lot of um, less of the long-term thinking and long-term strategy. Yeah, I mean, when we talked about volatility earlier, we were assuming it was market volatility, but actually we have client volatility as well. Um, in the sense, uh, a lot of students now are looking at the financial markets, and I think that got triggered by the COVID period and also the GameStop um, events and cryptos 
uh, students were coming into that. And of course, you, you know, some of their um, investing is not really investing. They're just buying and selling and trying to make a buck so they can pay student fees. But um, the, good one, the good thing about young people coming into investing is that although it can be volatile to begin with, it's a good segue for them to understand long-term investing. And, you know, we, we would help them with that. And that's one of the reasons why we started Opto three years ago. So, so young people, anybody can come on and sort of look at think investing. So, you know, you can see ethical investing. If, you, if you're quite passionate about uh, global warming or pollution, you can, you can sort of look down and see which companies that you want to invest in. Um, and also, we give performance of those stocks over a period of time. So you can really see if they're volatile. We can only go so far. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to take responsibility for your own investments. But as much, so long as we can give as much support and information and transparency and access to pricing and execution, that's, we can't really do much more. Don't know if you want to add, Chris. Um, if I'm hearing right, it's like why um, why are young people investing now? Is that so? I think every. I mean, nothing to add to Peter, other than I think from an education perspective, they are taught in schools and parents. You know, financial literacy has increased dramatically. Access to content has increased dramatically, especially through the internet. But I think it is important that young people do start investing very early, almost as soon as they can. Uh, I mean, you might have to pay off some student debt, but there's a balance there of paying off debt that's yielding 6% versus investing at 6% as well. So once you've paid off that debt, um, having something like a recurring monthly ETF purchase that will compound over time, and this is Warren Buffett's secret source, that compounding interest effect is incredibly powerful. And you can just do it, close your eyes, set it, set it against your bank, especially in CMC, we offer this. Um, and the beauty of CMC or someone like CMC, I'd love it to be CMC, but anyone, um, I'd encourage you to invest first. But secondly, there's no custody fees. There's no safe keep fees. So that erodes a lot of your performance in a hidden way through most platforms. There's no inactivity fees on our platform as well. And so you can save your, or purchase your ETF, assuming you make money on it, the f hidden fees in most platforms that you will never, ever know about. They're, that is what erodes your performance over time. And so I think, again, the way we design CMC is, one, we've got the benefit, our pricing plan reflects the scale that Peter and Matt have built. And at the same time, the plan reflects how we want people to trade in our platform. We want them to be with us for a long time, and hence we got rid of the custody fee, the settlement fee, the platform fee. I think that's quite important for investors to understand. Does anyone else have any questions? And feel free to ask about the House of Lords as well. Hello, uh, my name is Justin from CE. So um, you guys have talked about becoming a super app, right? Uh, now we have like DBS, UOB, all these banks trying to become super apps as well. And they too uh, they have um, brokerage platforms on their apps. So how are you intending like in the future to capture this market um, of people? Because right now in Singapore, like, I would say maybe 70 to 80% of Singaporeans have uh, the DBS app downloaded. But for CMC Invest, you guys are still new and not many of us know you guys. So what's the long-term plan to capture this market? And are you guys going to get a, like, a banking license or something in the future? Yeah. Uh, no comment on the banking license. But I'll give a great example is, um, let's take the banks we talked about earlier, the seven. And I'm a bit, for NDA reasons, we can't talk too much about the Singapore opportunity. But we power some of those banks you just mentioned. They do not have exchange seats. They do not have the tech we have. They don't have the settlement systems. The pre obviously have the funding. but. The, 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 the settlement, the pre-matching, the corporate actions, it's incredibly complicated back end. And to Peter's point, it's all about service. 
we service those banks that you, one of those banks you just mentioned is, is my customer. So it's not that we want to go out and compete with UOB, we want to be their partner. Yes, we want a retail brand, because that's important to CMC, but we also, our primary business is the institutional, or we, we call it INSTI internally, but it's a B2B and or a B2B to C offering. That's really our sweet spot. We know how to price risk and service customers. And I think that's actually quite important, that we don't want to necessarily just compete. We want to partner with everyone in Singapore. And, and we actually have a couple of big, again, I can't name the names, but we actually have a lot more than you realize here, but we're just a silent partner. And, and that's a really important thing to take away from this, that CMC is a institutional platform. No House of Lords questions? Conservative Party questions? I bet not many of you know what the House of Lords does. Exactly. What does the House of Lords do? Why am I in the House of Lords? Are you interested in this or do you just want to talk about business? You want me to talk about the House of Lords? I see a few head nods in the audience. So that's a yes, yeah? It was just five minutes. So the House of Lords is a bit like the compliance department of a company. Um, so governments get elected by, uh, through a general election. They have a manifesto. And in the manifesto, they talk about all the things that they want to do in the next five years. And then when they win the election, they then start to change things. So one of the things that they, uh, the Conservative government under Boris Johnson wanted to do was to leave the European Union. And so there was a law brought in to leave the European Union because that's what the people voted for. The government then fixes the law. It then goes to the House of Lords who then check the detail and make sure that we're not contravening any international laws, any human rights. I mean, it's quite a complex sort of thing to do is to study law, uh, you know, to, to look at the law. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a businessman, so I wouldn't necessarily look at laws surrounding the European Union. But if there are business changes, people, you know, entrepreneurs, that's where my area of expertise is. Um, Boris Johnson asked me, appointed me, you only get into the House of Lords if the Prime Minister nominates you and then the King, or the Queen it was with me, 2021, 20, uh, I went into the Lords, um, then they appoint you. It's an appointment from the Queen. Um, and so I represent the Queen to make sure that any government laws that come through are compliant, but only in my area of expertise. We have medical people, we have constitutional, charitable people. I'm an entrepreneur, so I help on the business side. I don't have to go in every day, it's voluntary. We have a chamber because we need protection. We get a title because we are appointed by the Queen we serve the Queen, but we need protection from litigation. So if we want to debate uh, something around the country's law, we don't make the laws. We're not allowed to make the laws. In principle, there are a few exceptions. But the laws are made by the government, then they come to us. When we debate those things, if we're not happy about them, we cannot be litigated, so we have our own chamber, which is next to the House of Commons, so we have that protection. I was appointed by Boris Johnson because I'm a Brexiteer. I was a supporter. I co-founded the group that won the referendum to leave the European Union. The European Union um, had become too political, uh, to, um, we became 
too integrated into a system that we never voted for. We voted, Britain voted to go into the European Union 40 odd years ago in 76. And that was the common market. The common market was where we could trade with each other, just like Singapore and Malaysia with no restrictions. You can, you can trade with each other, no laws, no, no fees and no custom payments and so on. That's how it started. But then it changed and it became uh, where laws were made outside of Britain, but we had to comply with those laws. We couldn't change, uh, you know, employment laws, uh, human rights laws were all determined by other people and we had to abide by those laws and we were beginning to lose our sovereignty. What's the point in having a general election and voting for a political party if they can't change the laws in the European Union? And quite surprisingly, not to me, but to the media, we voted to leave the European Union. I was a major part of that. And Boris Johnson asked me to go into the House of Lords as a Brexiteer. We need more people representative of the new Britain, which was to be outside of the European Union. And I absolutely love it in there. It doesn't affect my business. I normally leave the office. If I have to be in there, I normally attend about I'm normally required to attend about, let's say on average, one day a week over a six month period. But it can be two or three days a week. And normally what I do is I leave the office at three o'clock, go to the House of Lords, do my work, debate, have some dinner, go home, normally by about eight o'clock. But I have been there till one o'clock in the morning. It's a great honor and a great privilege for somebody uh, anyway in britain there are 65 million people there's only 800 odd people in the house of lords and i'm one of them it's a great privilege and an honor and part of my life's journey when you look at the small desk that i started cmc now we have 14 offices around the world one and a half million clients we're a public company and also part of that journey is my, the fact that uh, I came from a poor family, left school at 15, didn't go to university, and I'm now sitting in the House of Lords as well as chief executive of a brilliant company full of brilliant people with brilliant technology. So that's the House of Lords. Thank you. So. I think we've got one. We've got time for one last question, and then we'll. Uh, uh, I see a hand up. Okay, and then we'll have a, a, a drinks break before the female investing panel. Hey, hi. Um, actually, I have uh, two questions. <laughs> so I'm Shanison from Investing Know. The first question is, uh, you know, CMC, you guys are doing fantastic in Singapore, and uh, especially on CFD. So when people mention about CFD, you know, CMC will actually come into the mind. So I can even say that so, you know people equate that is too, you know. Now you guys launch a CMC Invest, and I understand it's actually mostly focused on investor. So what do you I mean plan to actually you know change in terms of the mindset for that? You know people might think about CMC is for CFD trading. Now how may I get you come to choices in terms of investing? And you guys just now mentioned about a super app. Is there any plans that you do think that you want to consolidate your business from CFD and invest too much into one in future, for example? And the second question I have is uh, in the past uh, two to three years, uh, those few uh, China fintech brokers like Mumu, Tiger, uh, Weibo, all those, has really done some uh, you know, shake up in terms of the whole Singapore uh, retail business. And recently we also know that the TDMI trade has pulled out in terms of the retail business. So, and we only have more than you know, 5 million of populations here. Do you think that Singapore market is big enough to have more uh, retail brokerage firms in Singapore and even, you know, the whole business that you can grow in from there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's break, let, let me break that down. I'll come, let me do number one first then. So, um, what was it? <laughs> uh, I, I so. 
Let me start with number two then, because it's probably easier. In terms of the Chinese brokers, and you mentioned a few, look, first of all, their platforms and apps are very good, okay? You've got to tip your hat to the competition here. Um, they are good. They've got a disruptive business model. But our model is very different. Again, I mentioned that we're really strong in white labeling and institutional flow because of the tech stack. And I know it's a horrible thing to say, but if we look at what's played out publicly recently, PDPA and GDPR um, were massive issues for TikTok in America. And I think that will manifest or continue to manifest into financial services. And the ability to white label or provide institutional flow vis-a-vis -vis data, I think will, will, will be a big advantage to CMC, which is a listed company in the UK. And, 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 and rightly or wrongly, the UK is seen largely as neutral, whereas China is at one end of a stick and the Americas at the other. And so I think there is room for all of us, but more importantly, we're playing in a very different game to those Chinese brokers you mentioned. So I'm not too worried about them. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not a fair fight in that sense, but they've done a great job. And, and to be honest, um, and then coming back to your first question, it, it's a really good point. When, when I thought of CMC before joining, I thought of CFD broker. And I think many do, and that's not an unfair uh, assumption to make. Part of the diversification strategy was born from the fact that Australia has that same uh, problem. What I can tell you is this, we have two different platforms because we believe that for our institutional offering, customers, especially retail, are not always suited to having CFD access. And the regulator, you can see, has gone from top left to bottom right in terms of access to leverage, uh, financial literacy, onboarding journeys. So we feel that having two separate platforms is a better outcome. And interestingly, if you look at someone like IG Index, they've just copied us. They are now launching a separate platform, specifically because they believe the same thing as we do. Now, is it easier to have a single app with CFDs and stocks? It, 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 look, I'm not going to lie to you, yes, it is easier. But the risk management that goes behind operating a CFD platform is incredible because of the leverage, because of the risk. A lot of those times, those CFD brokers are taking that risk on their books. That has huge balance sheet implications, risk management implications. And what you could have peace of mind knowing is that our invest platform is completely ring-fenced from that. Separate legal team, separate legal entity, separate balance sheet, separate staff. CMC's literally built two separate platforms. They do not talk to each other. So I, my personal view is that it's actually a, an, a, an edge for us. Because if you want to use our platform, you know that there is no balance sheet risk from cross-contamination from CFD. And I think actually that is one of CMC's big edges, especially in this environment. Because you are seeing brokers, or I think we, we're at the start of seeing several brokers leaving Singapore. Oh, uh, sorry, do you, want to, do you want to take that one? Um, yeah, you, one of your questions was, that, um, would we merge the two companies into one? Um, I mean, the answer to that is that we've got, we, we, we've got quite a diverse structure in the business, primarily to protect ourselves and to protect our clients. And, you know, we've got different investment um, licenses around the world, different regulators. Operationally, would there be synergies if we merged everything into one? I'm not so sure there would be. Um, we can tap into resources in different companies. Maybe there would be some tax advantages to put everything into sort of merging these two companies. If you go to Australia, we've completely transformed our brand there. Um, we started life as a CFD broker. We now really have a very strong brand there because of technology as well as, you know, investing. Um, CMC seems to be perceived as 
well, and quite rightly so, is that we're very, very good at technology. We have lots of technology partners and we invest a lot in that. If we were to, yeah, but no, there's, no, there's nothing, nothing planned to merge and there'd be no real advantage in doing that. Okay, thank you so much uh, for panelists. I've come out from the, uh, the shadows. Uh, Pamela, thank you so much. I've got a lot to learn from a presentation standpoint. You're fantastic. So